Hello once again, and welcome to Tuesdays with Lloyds, an ongoing virtual conversation with Lloyds underwriters and their distribution partners in both London and the U.S. My name is Pat Talley, Regional Director and Managing Agent Practice Group Leader for Lloyds in the U.S. Today marks the sixth installment of our Syndicate Showcase Series, a monthly event where we welcome senior executives from the Syndicate's leadership team to share their perspective on a wide range of topics, including market conditions, challenges and opportunities, emerging risks, the future at Lloyd's, and a host of others. It also provides a great opportunity for you, our audience, to ask questions. So far this year, we've featured top executives from Apollo, Hiscox, Aegis, Ascot, and Munich Re. And today, we are very pleased to welcome MS Anwin, which operates Syndicate 2001 at Lloyd's. Joining us today are Johan Slabert, Chief Executive Officer, and Andrew Carrier, Chief Underwriting Officer. We've included a brief biography for both Johan and Andrew in the chat box for your further review. Before we begin, just some quick housekeeping. We strongly encourage you to submit questions during the discussion, but please use the Q&A tool and not the chat feature. This makes managing our Q&A easier and it ensures that we answer as many questions as possible. Today's session is being streamed live on Lloyd's YouTube channel and will be recorded. If you like the session, please take a moment to refer the channel to colleagues and clients. Dozens of previous sessions are also available for viewing on demand, and we'll drop a link in the chat box momentarily. And with that, welcome again to our guests, and let's get started. Uh, Johan, great to see you again, sir. Let's start off with you, if we may, and you know, set the table a bit. Please tell us about MS Amlin its history and its place within the Lloyd's market. Good morning, um, uh, Pat, just to check that you can hear me and I'll uh, continue. Um, yes. Yeah, certainly. thanks um, for hosting us this morning and showcasing MS Amlin. I'll start off with maybe just a brief description of, of the, the organization itself by referring to the MS first. The MS is Mitsui Sumitomo which is our parent company. Um, you know, they have about a 300 plus year um, experience and history in the insurance market. For us, um, we track our origins back to Syndicate 40, 40, which is about 118 years old. Um, the name change took place roughly 1998 um, when there was a further merger of, of syndicates. And in 2016, we were acquired by uh, Mitsuri Sumitomo. Uh, we have about 30 classes of business um, across insurance and reinsurance, and about 580 people, circa uh, 580 people across London, uh, Singapore, Dubai, Malaysia, and the US as well. Um, and that's excluding the rest of our group capability. Right? It's, uh, it's interesting when you say uh, Mitsui Sumitomo, I, I, in a former life, I was in the securities industry, and I recall that name being a very significant player in uh, fixed income institutional uh, business. So that name goes a long way with me. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a good summation and backstory. Let's expand on that uh, a bit further. What, what is it that you think distinguishes MS Amlin or sets it apart from the rest of the market? Yes. Yeah, so, um... I think if I start off on, on that question, Pat, you know, the, the I wouldn't say that Amlin is synonymous with Lloyd's, but we've certainly been around a very long time, uh, part of the fabric, the DNA, and, and the resilience, I think, that we have of having a couple of bad or, or challenging years behind us, being able to come back and, and certainly retake our place and stage as a pillar within the Lloyd's organization. Um, you know, we, we, we have a goal to be a prestigious underwriting business with a uh, market share worthy of, of our heritage and our potential. And that speaks to our history, but also is a focus on our future. Um, and I think if I maybe hand over to Andrew, he can talk about the uniqueness and the relationships we have on the underwriting side. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, as Johan said, we have some very long standing relationships, uh, having been operating in the market for so many years. And I, I know relationship is sometimes a, a hackneyed uh, word in our industry that's banded around too freely. But 
uh, you know, we really do have uh, trading, uh, trading statistics uh, and, and the proof of um, long-standing relationships with many Lloyd's clients, which we think is important because at, at the end of the day, uh, our product uh, is essentially a promise to pay. So it's very important that uh, you can walk the talk uh, with, with policyholders in, in establishing that trust. So uh, it, it's it's more than just uh, an, a, a nice legacy franchise. Uh, it's something that we do try to, to to leverage and add value with the fact that we've um, we're, we're a long-standing player and we've been uh, we've been at it for a long time. So true, the whole uh, intangible issue. We don't sell a product, it's just a promise. So uh, a, a great point there. Um, uh, Johan, I, let's maybe do a little bit of looking into the, over the past 18 months, I think we would all agree that uh, that period has been one of the most difficult in memory for, for many, many reasons. But as we hopefully see COVID retreating and some signs of at least a, a partial return to more normal aspects of working, what do you see as Amlin's biggest challenges as we you know, close out 2021 and, and move headfirst into 2022? Yeah, I think, Pat, the, um, the, the word COVID is probably never excluded from um, an insurance report or, or uh, assessment in the, in the last couple of, um, or at least the last 18 months. But I also believe it's going to be with us for the next at least 18 months because we surely haven't seen the end of it. Um, I think what we tend to forget as well is in addition to COVID, we had Brexit preceding COVID. Um, and I think a combination of those have certainly put more stress on our organization, you know, not just Amlin, but the Lloyd's environment. We've had a default to, to using a, a higher um, amount of technology solutions I think combined with the Brexit, we, we probably across the industry are facing some challenges around skills. I think um, COVID have made some people sit back and think, well, you know, maybe I should take a different route in life. Um, and we're certainly seeing that. I think during this period, we've certainly also seen, and as we head into 2022, a slight shift from COVID to other global pressing issues like um, you know, climate change, um, imbalance in society in terms of, um, you know, diversity and inclusion. So there has certainly been an historical landscape change, but also a couple of new things that we have to keep our eyes on as we go into 2022. Um, Andrew, I'm sure you want to elaborate on that. Uh, sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, without repeating what Johan said, I think the, uh, you know, going through a global pandemic has had the effect of uh, accelerating what was probably a, a natural progressive change that was taking place uh, naturally. I mean, even um, the, the people on the call today who are visitors to London will know that um, in, in, in the London and Lloyd's market, you know, we, uh, for 300 years, we all dressed very smartly in suits and ties. And, and while Johan and I have a tie on Johan even has a jacket um, you know the, the pandemic uh, accelerated uh, uh, that that natural need to not necessarily uh, dress up to the nines to do business I, I'm, I'm being slightly playful but it's a it's a it's an example of of how a, a, a progression became accelerated I, I think um, certainly climate change from an underwriting point of view is is front and center of mind for me because um, you know, something is going on with the world's weather patterns that impacts the the product we sell as an industry, not, not just on the property side, but but in many aspects of, the, of our products. And to some extent, we use the past as a guide to the future. Uh, and the extent to which we can use the past as a guide to the future is, is just simply no longer the case to the extent it has been hitherto. So we do seem to be at some kind of inflection point uh, and, and that's really, you know, having a dramatic impact on our on our prognosis and on our forward calculations in in, in calculating the the fair risk adjusted reward we seek as a carrier in the industry. So that's probably top of the list for me. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a good summary of the of the many external influences that that affect the business, and and as you said, the knock on effects on underwriting, of course. 
uh, can't be ignored. Uh, keeping in that same theme, since you both mentioned uh, climate change, uh, you know, Lloyd's in 2020 published its first environmental, social, and governance or ESG report, which uh, supports the global transition to net zero and commits the market to publicly accountable targets uh, for responsible underwriting and investment. Uh, be interested to hear hearing your specific views on ESG and particularly if there are any if there's anything specific to MS Amlin as to how it is approached. Johan, you care to take that one? Yeah. ESG is, is a very large undertaking, but a necessary one. Um, I think if you look at the components within ESG, environmental, social and governance, um, starting with the environmental, um, I will reiterate the fact that our parent has officially made a statement that, um, you know, we would help our partners to achieve a zero underwriting um, you know, impact by 2050. So there is some work to be done on that. We as a syndicate um, have uh, signed up to ClimateWise and um, we're also participating in the PRA's assessment, which is referred to as the CBES, which is a future stress scenario, looking at alternative um, impacts on a, either a, a early action, a late action or a no action. Um, and I think out of that, we will determine what the ultimate outcome would be. As, as Andrew said, the, the historical models look at historical patterns, but there's certainly been a shift, um, which has been quite not notable. Um, you know, I refer to um, kitty cats rather than cats because they seem to sit slightly under the radar, but they certainly have an aggregation. When I shift from, from the E to the S in terms of social, our parent is, is certainly encouraging us to find solutions for the societies that we operate in. So although as a syndicate clearly want to manage our risk around um, uh, natural catastrophes, but from a parent's perspective and service, serving the uh, societies or the uh, communities around us, we certainly also seek to solve a solution or solve or seek to find a solution um, in that particular area. Um, from a social, social perspective, you know, we operate um, with a number of charities involved. So we're always looking at, um, you know, bettering the community around us. Uh, we have a very um, strong diversity and inclusion um, uh, motive and theory here. Um, uh, we participate and sponsor the dive-in activities around the world. And for those who have seen the press recently, we've also bought into a MGA in the US uh, called Inclusive, which um, is um, specializing in the LBGT plus community, as well as the mon ethnic minority business groups. So for us, that is a, a very f um, strong indication and focus on that particular part of the, the society. And from a governance perspective, many important things for us around governing the organization, the industry, um, but also showing that resilience that is required for us, uh, not just as a, as a syndicate, but as a market to be able to bounce back after significant events. Um, so that's sort of at a high level. Um, Andrew can cover some of the specific, specific aspects around our underwriting approach to that. Sure. Thanks, Johan. I think on the underwriting side, it's it's probably the environmental dimension uh, that it preys on our mind the most. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, changing weather patterns and climate change is, is, is very much uh, a cause of um, not concern, but something we're trying to get our heads around. And, and it's interesting that, you know, we as uh, assumers of risk uh, where our product is being Im impacted by the uncertainty of environmental change, you know, we are in that sense, we are very much on the same side of the fence uh, of, of anyone who's concerned with climate change. I'm, I'm not, you know, saying we're uh, siding with, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the climate activists and so forth, but the, the definitely we have a serious concern uh, about what is going on in, in, in weather patterns. And so we're trying to do this with a with a with a partnership approach, so uh, many of our customers uh, operate, for example, in the in the energy space. Now, the, the the world and society will always need 
some form of energy, you know, whether that's ultimately renewable or not. Therefore, you know, the last thing we want to do is is uh, suddenly have a change in philosophy in terms of our, our energy relation. Sure. Well, uh, it's, <clears throat> it's covered a lot of ground there. Excellent summation. Um, sticking just a little bit more, uh, let's wrap up the, some of the challenges we've been experiencing. I think uh, the Lloyd's market as a whole seems to have done pretty well through COVID, particularly given that the underwriting room uh, was closed for long periods and essentially all work was being done remotely. Uh, has that, how has that worked for MS Am Amblin's uh, firm wide and has it posed any special challenges or made you rethink things about how you operate? Um, yeah, I think the, um, the, 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 the Lloyd's market has really um, probably uh, faced a, 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 a challenge in the fact that we are working remotely. Um, and, you know, that, that creates a challenge from a, a learning and teaching and coaching point of view, uh, because we do, we do um, benefit from the fact that we're all in one place. Um, and so not having the availability of people to be close to each other really uh, uh, really you know gives us a challenge from a, from a from a training and development point of view. Um, but I think we have on the whole um, succeeded very well to continue to transact and uh, you know we've remained successful in selling our product uh, you know while we've all become working remotely uh, and, and that's something that um, you know we, we as an industry we should feel good about. I think so. You're right. It's, it, nothing worse than being thrown in the deep end of the pool, but it, it seems like collectively uh, we've, we've done pretty well at keeping our head above water. Uh, Johan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, certainly. Um, and I think um, a number of things to, to just add to that in terms of London as a city and a, and a market, clearly um, we've managed to sort of move into a hybrid working environment. And I think, you know, having partially or actually a short week in the in presence, which would be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seems to be the trend. We're trying to push it out back into a Monday and a, and a Friday. Um, but but we do want to treat people like adults. We do want to give them the option of um, working in the best possible manner that, that fits and suits them, but also making sure that we, we can adhere to our clients and our, our brokers' um, requirements. I think the one thing that I find us as management and executives of companies is in this new environment, we, we have to shift our focus um, from measuring people's input. Historically, a lot of people come into the office and we expect them to sit behind the desk and tapping away at their PCs. And that I'm sort of referring to as input, but also measure or primarily measure their output. And unfortunately, we, we only do that once a year. And that's when we have an appraisal process. So, you know, I think at the outset, when we hire people, the, the requirements should be about output. It shouldn't be about input. It shouldn't be about where they work, but definitely focused on output. And that output should, as Andrew mentioned, include training, interaction, certain things that we expect to take place. Um, so there, there should be, and it's not just applicable to the insurance industry. It's not just applicable to lawyers or ourselves, but, but be a bit of a mind shift. Um, each organization, I think, will be different. But if, Pat, if I can add something to that. Um, Certainly. I think the hybrid model uh, is something that we're grappling with. And um, I had an experience yesterday afternoon when it was getting late in the day. And I was, you know, anxious to get uh, back home to my family. Uh, and I had a couple of emails that came in that were really looking for a you know, framing a nuanced question, looking for a yes, no answer. And they probably took 15 minutes to compose. And I was faced with the, the challenge of probably writing a 15 minute reply and reading the, uh, the attachment. Had we been in the same place, it would have been just uh, a head behind the door. How about this? Uh, you know, so I, I just wonder whether unconsciously we're taking much more time working remotely when, you know, if we were just leaning across the desk we'd actually be more efficient. So uh, personal view, I still think we're coming to terms with the hybrid model. Yeah, agreed. Well put, well put. And I like the, the, the thought of it's about what you produce and being more agnostic about 
the where, when, and how uh, as being forced by uh, hybrid working situations. Excellent. Uh, before we jump into the U.S. Uh, business landscape, I wanted to ask you, we've asked each CEO we've had on this one question. Uh, uh, Johan, what keeps you awake at night? The, the, the one thing. Uh, Pat, I sleep like a baby, which means I wake up every few hours crying. Um, <laughs> I, I would say we pretty much nailed some of the topics that I, that I, I would say in short, is probably not a single thing. I think externally, I worry about climate change and inflationary impact going forward. Um, internally, I would say um, skill shortages and, and re really pursuing our DNI strategy. And I think all of those collectively, um, you know, really contributes to rebuilding Amlin and really focuses on meeting the client's demands. You know, if, if, if we can continue to focus and, and, and address those internal and external factors. Sure. Uh, that, that touches on, on some common themes we've, uh, we've heard from others. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take a stab? Do you sleep as well? <laughs> um, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I try to sleep soundly, but, you know, there's always some, uh, uh, something unexpected in the underwriting world. So s similar to, to you. Well, let's, let's pivot to the immediate business outlook for Amlin. Uh, there, there has been a lot of change uh, at MS Amlin over the last few years. Uh, you and Andrew are part of a, of a new team, and it, it really looks like things are going in a new and positive direction. What are the plans for your syndicate on the underwriting side for, for the rest of 2021 and, more importantly, 2022? And do you have plans to grow in the U.S.? Shall I take that first, Dan? Um, yeah, please do. So uh, I think on the organic side, we, you know, um, as I said earlier, MS Amelin has been around for a long time. So we have a significant uh, existing portfolio. Um, you know, our plan is to leverage some of those longstanding relationships and, and, and maybe uh, take a bigger position on certain lines of business where we think we're getting uh, a, 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 an appropriate risk adjusted reward. Uh, and so it will be steady, progressive, um, um, profitable growth, uh, focusing on the lines where we think we have longstanding expertise. Um, yeah, so to, to add to that from an inorganic perspective um, and to answer your, your question, Pat, regarding the U.S., the U.S. remains a very large um, and viable market. And for us, that is an important part of our business today. So it wouldn't be a new strategy. But we, we certainly have, I think, made it very clear that we, we the, one of the important things for us is proximity and understanding of risk. And for us, that means looking at the the um, the distribution that has that proximity and the understanding of risk. And and you would have seen in the press over the last few months, we've made two two acquisitions or an acquisition invested in another one, um, inclusive. We've already spoken about and uh, ITMA, um, which is one of our transportation. Um, uh, MGAs done done in Arizona. We we certainly intend to continue to look at opportunities where um, there are pockets of risks that fit with what Andrew has on the organic side. Um, clearly, we 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 certainly don't want to take a shotgun approach and start writing risks that we haven't written before. Um, what we want to do is focus on the lines that we've gone through remedial process. Um, if it fits Andrew's criteria, we go out and pursue opportunities in the U.S., uh, in the MGA and wholesale market. So, yes, we are going to continue focusing on the U.S. and we will continue to invest in that space. Okay, uh, great to hear. And I did, I did read a story recently about that acquisition and, uh, and investment. So, so uh, good to give us some background on that. Um, uh, let's move out a little, look a little bit into the future. Uh, before we do look at some of the specifics, do you have any thoughts on the role that Lloyd's plays or perhaps needs to play in global insurance and reinsurance moving forward? Andrew? Yeah, I think Lloyd's has always uh, been at the vanguard uh, of some of the developments in the in the global marketplace. Um, you know, it's it's had an entrepreneurial 
uh, mindset. It's often been uh, in product development and creating new products. So I think that will um, always be a part uh, of our DNA. There is a, a slight challenge in, in terms of, as we talked earlier, if we move towards a hybrid virtual uh, remote working, how that will continue. But I, I do see um, Lloyd's you know, very much keeping its importance. It's still, when we have new elements of risk developing, Lloyd's is at the forefront of developing the wordings, the clauses that address those new risks that emerge. Uh, I, I don't see any change in that regard. Uh, and also the, the, the natural self-generation that's part of the Lloyd's model, um, I see as being continue to, uh, to, to play a key role uh, in, in how we move forward. And, and, and I guess as a, as a follow-up, uh, what, what about the syndicates and managing agents themselves? Where and what is their role in this future? I, I, I think, um, as, I, uh, as I said, in terms of the self-generation, the, we're in an industry that has low barriers to entry. Uh, new entrants and startups are a, uh, a fundamental part of the landscape. And so I think the managing agents uh, are well positioned to bring out the best in, in that self-generation um, element of, of the Lloyd's model uh, in the fact that we do naturally uh, uh, generate a, a fertile training ground for new underwriters and new syndicates to emerge under the, uh, the, the appropriate management of the managing agent. And, and so that, that, that suits the natural direction of our industry. Yeah. I would, um, Pat, add, add to that slightly. If we're looking at generally, you know, what's the role of a syndicate or a managing agent going forward? You know, I think it's to continue to seek, um, you know, existing solutions for all our policyholders. I think there's, a, there's definitely a couple of areas of concern. Um, and we're in the position, as Andrew mentioned earlier, we're in a single location, to, to do um, a bit of uh, brainstorming, um, a bit of a, a session that will allow us to think broader rather than some of the traditional products. And, you know, we got to look at systemic risks. We've got to look at large, complex issues. And I think as things are developing with both climate change, pandemics, um, a number of other elements that are pushing businesses into a digital, digital solution and a, and, a, and a cyber exposure, I think we need to look at that as a market. I think climate change, which we've already mentioned, pandemics, as we mentioned, I think there's some real world issues. And I think our role is to, to collectively get together as a single market, um, as Lloyd's, and find solutions to some of those problems. Um, you know, we, 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 we exist as a result of finding solutions in the insurance environment. And I think that would set us apart and allow us to step up back into the into its rightful place as the Lloyd's market. Right. Uh, well put. Good summary. Uh, uh, and I'm taking a few notes, <laughs> trying to do a few things at once. So it's it's good to, to get this input. Uh, I want to pivot to a, what might be a deceptively simple question, perhaps. But uh, what observations do you have around changing market conditions, and what does this mean for MS Amlin? Actually, I think, from uh, I, I'm gonna, yeah, I was going to say I'm going to leave this one for Andrew. Okay. Sure. I mean, the market conditions are in a constant state of flux. That sort of goes with the turf we're in. Um, but what I think it translates to is that um, our margins are becoming continually um, uh, depressed. I mean, as as the market finds new levels of efficiencies, our challenge is to find new ways of operating uh, a responsible business and, and surviving on, on, on the challenge of, of markets, of, of, of margins becoming suppressed. So that's our, that's our ongoing challenge. It, it certainly has been perhaps exacerbated by some of the consolidation we've seen, not, not just in, in the client space, but even in the, in the distribution and broker space. So, um, as as 
some of our, our distributors and even our customers have got bigger, their demands have got greater, more sophisticated. And, and so that, 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 that just increases the, the rising challenge we face every day. I would, um, I would add to what Andrew said in, the, in, in a way that, you know, we, if we look at all the external factors, inflation, climate change, you know, the frequency of events, all of that's putting pressure on margin and ultimately will put pressure on pricing. And um, I, I, I'm not sure that that can continue. So we have a responsibility of looking at how do, how do we actually reduce the cost to produce that policy or that commitment that we make. Um, and that can only go that far. Um, I think there are, you know, considerations around infrastructure, technology, things like that. We as a market have probably spent, retired, spent more, retired more, and ultimately that also contributes to margin and that ultimately pushes price up as well. So there certainly is, um, you know, internal factors that are, that are changing the market conditions as well. You, you brought up some some very uh, some very large topics uh, that, that that produce stress. Do you do you do you think these changes will ultimately impact the distribution process, uh, in, say in the states, and and if so, how? You know, I, ideally, um, in a perfect world, we would would like to see a very simplified um, data exchange capability across the industry. Um, you know, and that, that's not just lawyers, it's not just the syndicates, but I think globally, you know, look at the banks versus insurance. Um, you know, for us, the, the US market is all about really understanding risk and proximity to that risk. Um, hence the reason why I think that's quite important. I think the, the large broker mergers and acquisitions is going to create a uh, or spill over into the the, the uh, smaller um, either brokers, MGAs, wholesalers. So the, the competition at that level will also um, you know become a bit more fierce. So having the right capacity or support behind you from a carrier does help those uh, players. I think there will continue to be new new players in the broker and MGA space as they come out of either retirement from being a broker or being an underwriter. Um, so, you know, I think that that will continue to put a bit more stress on the distribution uh, channel itself. And I think where MS Samalin comes into this is that, you know, we are always looking for those pockets where there's an alignment of interest, particularly with our distribution partners. Um, you know, not not just in the fundamental profitability, but the areas where we're, you know, we're, we're really working together and trying to achieve the same outcome. That that for us, I think, will be the the win win that MS Amlin finds with its distribution partners. Sure, sure, well said. Um, uh, we actually, before we go to the Q and A, uh, which we've got several questions that have come up. Uh, one last question, and, and it's keeping the same uh, touch points of what we've talked about in terms of technology. Uh, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about change and the pandemic only serving to accelerate some of these changes. Uh, but the, from a technology perspective, you know, the Future Lloyd's Initiative is committed to building the world's you know, most technically, uh, technologically advanced marketplace. But, but how do you view the role, the, the critical role of technology in the industry moving forward and specifically how it uh, uh, applies to MS Amway? Yeah, Pat, that's been a recurring theme from uh, sort of early 60s, isn't it? To build <laughs> the most techn technologically advanced um, market. Um, you know, I, I use a simple example of in the US in particular, if you look at um, medical, the, the doctors use a standardized code versus the veterinarians don't standardize treatment for, for pets. So you have two very distinct markets. And I think for us, the banking is equal to the doctors because it's a standard coding system. Um, you know, transaction on one side of the world gets ref reflected in another side of the world um, on a single backbone. I think the insurance industry is probably more like the veterinarians. We protect the data. We do things differently. Um, and I think that's, that's a little bit unnecessary. I think um, operationally, if we can have a standardization of data and infrastructure, but also 
independently tactical software around areas that Andrew would talk about in terms of pricing, modeling, that becomes bespoke using external data. But I think there's certainly a large chunk of, um, you know, cost associated with our underlying policy systems, data, uh, data that is embedded in that, also on the claim side, where in particular in our market, um, we certainly use multiple recapturing of the same policy information. And I think if we can get that, that backbone across the insurance industry standardized with a standard data set, I think we're in the game. Okay, yeah. okay. Anything to add to that? I, I think, yeah, that the technology uh, being used to support our product, particularly on the way, uh, you know, we, we have some expensive duplicative mechanisms is still an area uh, where where we could affect uh, great change. Um, it's, it's almost, it doesn't sound very sexy, but it's the, the back office rather than the front office is in, in my personal view where we could really make some efficiencies. A joint effort. Um, okay, well, now we're gonna pivot over to the, uh, the Q and A uh, section. Uh, we've got several questions. I'm just gonna throw these out and, and you can, uh, uh, Johan, Andrew, take take uh, your pick as to who wants to respond to either one. The first one: um, How much influence does Mitsui Sumitomo have on what you write and the daily running of MS Amway? Um That's a good good question, Pat. So um, we have a annual planning on a entity basis where we basically confirm our appetite by cloth of business um, session, and then we have an international planning session. Um, that takes place. We do a quarterly report and a monthly report, but we very seldom gain, you know, interference or, or a uh, request to write business that is either outside of our appetite or a change to our appetite throughout the year. It's more of an annual process. Um, but then the expectations are that we have the authority um, and we're accountable for, for um, you know, delivering a return on the capital they provide us with. Okay. Let's see. I think I would add to that, you know, our, our underwriting practitioners uh, are, in, are are very much empowered. So, so you know, they are both technical underwriters and marketeers. So, so that they, uh, the decision is, you like, devolve very downstream in the MS Amlin model. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, this next question is is, a, is addressed to you, Andrew. Uh, does Andrew feel the wind exposed U.S. property is currently being underpriced by the market? And if so, by what degree? Gosh, that, that's a question that's sort of tempting uh, a one word answer and a, and a number, uh, which I'm not sure uh, I feel brave enough to give. But certainly, as, as I said earlier, the, the fact that weather patterns are changing and, and, the, and the ability for us to use the past as a guide to the future is dr dramatically impacting uh, the way we think about the future. Uh, yes, I, I, I wonder whether we are going through an inflection point and that is really recognized by the market. I mean, the, the incidence of fires in, 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 in the Western areas of the United States is a practical example. Um, and the, the sheer frequency of windstorms we're seeing in the Gulf or the Eastern Seaboard does beg the question. So, so I, I concur with the direction, the, the implied direction of that question, uh, but, but I, 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 I couldn't possibly answer it quantitatively. Okay, we can always try. <laughs> so, no, I understand that. Yeah, it, there's, it's a complex and big, it's a. a a lot of talk, a lot of a lot of subject to cover, and uh, we could spend another hour on that. Um, uh, our next question is: uh, We'd like to get both your views on the impact of demographic changes we are seeing in the U.S. Uh, the the effect they're having on historical trends, and the analysis of how best to deploy aggregates to evaluate risk exposures. Andrew, um, shall I try that one again? Yeah, uh, I mean yeah. it was. Um, I, I forget what the number was. Other people on the call may know this better than me. But but uh, you know, approximately uh, half of the global population live uh, by or very near to uh, to the coast. So that in inevitably, and there is, you know, 
gradual migration uh, from the rural areas towards towards being near the sea. So that inevitably is going to create an escalation in in our PMLs, and and we're always, as an industry, playing catch up in in assessing that. So it does have um, an impact on our calculations, um, which. Um, it, r r rather like some of the comments I've made earlier about climate change are, are something that we have to keep a very close eye on. Yeah, I'd, I'd add a little bit to that. Um, I, w I would also note that we have made some slight um, shifts from certain territories in the US already um, as a result of high levels of frequency. Um, in the old days, we, we would really look at property as a line and balance that out. I think within the, the cat property area, we're doing a balancing act within that rather than just using property against casualty and other other classes. So it has become a lot more focused and pointed towards managing um, and evaluating our, our exposure in a particular class and in particular the, the, um, the reinsurance um, cat exposure that we have. Okay. Bit of a lightning round. We'll just, keep, we'll just keep going through these questions. Uh, how difficult is it these days to attract new, young, qualified people into the Lloyd's market? Well, um, I, th I think there's a uh, there's maybe a positive and a negative here, and, and the press would have, um, you know, quite quite um, recently talked about the skill shortages, and there's certainly challenges within our industry, you know, in terms of very specialized areas, wording, some of the claims capabilities and, and things like that. However, we've been, and Andrew's been very successful, clearly he's got a very attractive personality, but our graduate program has just taken in a, a very good, bright cohort of, of young, interested people who you know, quite frankly, I think we always joke about the fact that nobody goes to university to join an insurance company. Um, but our graduate program has actually been very, very successful. Andrew, do you want to elaborate on that, Cole? Sure. Um, I think if you break it down into the real fundamentals, then the, the three raw materials of our industry are capital, data, and people. Um, and, you know, forgive me for making sweeping statements, but capital has been reasonably abundant. Uh, data is very abundant with the advances in technology. So the area where we at MS Amelin are putting a lot of importance and focus is on that third raw material in, in the quality of our human capital. So we're, we're we think it's an investment in time and resource to really focus hard on making sure that um, we're getting the, 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 the very best early talent we can find to, to coach and nurture through for, to be the future of our business. It's a, I know it's a chronic problem here in the US. I, I, I used to know the statistic, but it's some huge percentage of this industry will be retiring in the next uh, three to five years. And so it's, it's so critical to, to bring on the next generation. So. Uh, excellent question there. Um, next question. Now, uh, which classes of business give you the most challenge at present? I'm, I'm sure Andrew's going to give you a more rounded answer, but I'll say cyber, cyber, and cyber. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think to, to us, it's always, you know, it's embedded in there unless we have exclusions or specific language around that. One, if a government like the U.S. is struggling to define and protect, you know, against cyber, um, clearly we're going to have an exposure. There's no modeling around it. Um, and I'll, I'll stop preaching and I'll, I'll get Andrew to give you a more, more uh, calculated response to that. I, I think, I mean, that reminds me uh, of your question earlier about sleeping at night and, 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 and maybe I answered uh, too nonchalantly you know uh, th there are there are some uh, classes of business where we believe the systemic risk is perhaps underappreciated by some of the broader market and and, and cyber uh, as, as Johan mentioned is is perhaps one example of that uh, I, I think um, the way I'd answer that question is 
many of our products in our industry are becoming commoditized and homogenized where there's a, 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 a mass of homogenous data and that then relies on a um, an organization with a good operational model to 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 operate efficiently in the marketplace uh, we are trying to find areas where the the risk is perhaps harder to calculate perhaps there isn't the same homogeneity of data that's accessible to underpin that risk and and then use a blend of art and science to to best calculate the uh, the risk uh, and premium appropriate uh, uh, and 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 that's probably in the in the less commoditized lines you know that that that's probably where our space is right now okay uh, this next question uh, is to you, Andrew. Uh, with with some syndicates changing their appetite and withdrawing from certain lines, do you think Lloyd's is still the home for complex and catastrophe exposed risks? Um, y yes, uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Now, um, the question uses complex and catastrophe in the same uh, phrase, and I think there's a little difference there, but certainly. Risks which are complex, uh, risks where there is perhaps some volatility, and that volatility is difficult to, to calculate. I do think Lloyd's uh, remains at the vanguard of that, uh, of that space uh, because of some of the things we touched on earlier, with it being a, a dynamic market where collectively we can, we can leverage uh, the thought leadership of each other, uh, syndicates operating in the same space. So um, th there will always be exits from markets. Uh, there will always be change. But I, I do remain uh, confident in, in, uh, in Lloyd's continuing its leadership role in those more complex risks. OK, uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, one, uh, let's see the next one. Uh, how or does MS Amlin leverage business from the insure tech ecosystem uh, in order to automate repetitive stereotypical processes to, to reduce costs of risk modeling, underwriting claims, and so on? Um, I'll, I'll have a stab at that, um, Pat. So um, I would start off by saying that our uh, parent company has a venture department, which is called MS, MS and AED Ventures. Their primary focus is investing in insure tech and fintech companies. I think now they have about 60 com six zero companies in their portfolio. <clears throat> Out of that, we get an opportunity to assess, um, you know, the capabilities that they bring to the market and whether it is, you know, modeling, whether it's underwriting, whether it's claims, whether that's a process improvement. Um, we get to see what's going on in the market and, um, you know, we if we like what they're doing, we can either participate on the risk or deploy that technology um, within Amlin. I think if we look at insure techs, the thing that to me is the most important, um, you know, at the moment is really the capability to do risk differentiation based on third party or new information. I think if we're going to look at insure techs just to you know, improve facilitating the process, um, you know, capturing data for claims purposes. To me, that's not, that's just automation or, or improvements to your technology. It's not truly insure tech. To me, it's about the differentiation or the breakdown of a risk that allows you to, to underwrite different elements or components within a traditional risk. A lot to chew on there. Um, let's see, we have, I think, time for one more question because I want to give you both an opportunity to, to give any kind of a synopsis or, or parting messages. Um, uh, MS Amlin is investing in the U.S. Is this where you believe the future lies for you in terms of opportunities? Uh, Johan? Yeah, look, our, our uh, parent company some time ago um, at an analyst or investor relationship meeting um, made a statement that we're committing to growing um, in, in the U.S. I think he's, they, he's specifically earmarked a, a reasonable amount of 
uh, capital for the investment in both distribution and potentially in, in uh, carrier capability there. Um, it remains an important market to us. It remains an important market to the world. I think a lot of the the global markets sort of benchmark them, themselves against the U.S. market. So for us, the focus is there. We, we're not going to neglect the other areas that we currently write. Um, but I think from a growth and expansion perspective, we've already established a holding company there. And as you know, we've already started making investments in distribution that fits with our underwriting criteria. And that is something we're going to continue to do. And it, and it goes to follow, as we've seen at the, the, the mid-year summary from WSIA, is that I think the surplus lines segment is up about 17% year over year. Uh, and, and as of last year, Lloyd's is now fully a quarter of that part of the market. So uh, it certainly sets the stage for additional growth and penetration in the U.S. Um, I wanted to give you a few minutes, uh, Johan and Andrew, to, to, if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share uh, before we close. We have, you know, uh, a captive audience here for you to, to get any additional points you'd like to get out. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I, I, I think the um, maybe the closing statement from my perspective is uh, we touched on a number of areas that um, are of concern to us, and I'm sure it is to the producers and the policyholders. And I think collectively, we as a group are going to invest and look at research and development around product solutions. We're not running away from property cat exposure. Um, you know, our parents is expecting us to look at solutions um, for the society or the community that we operate in. So that, that that's a, a requirement from, from their perspective. Um, I think for us, the, the US, um, in particular, the distribution we're looking at, it's, it's about proximity. Um, and understanding risk and something Andrew mentioned earlier for us is, is really the alignment. Um, absolutely key, because if we have that alignment, we understand what our distributors and, and market are trying to achieve and, and how they manage risk. And it's aligned to what our philosophy is on risk. Then I think we got a really good start. Um, you know, on that note, I'd really like to, to reach out to everybody who's, who's kindly participated and say, if, if what you heard today does um, float your boat, ring a bell, whichever expression you prefer, um, do reach out to us. Reach out to Lloyds and, and to MS Hamlin. Um, we're happy to have a conversation. Great point. Great point. Thank you, Johan. Uh, Andrew, any closing thoughts? Well, um, no, I think Johan has uh, said exactly what I was going to say. So uh, <laughs> it uh, comes from both of us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, um, that's great. We'll, uh, we're going to end up finishing a few minutes short. Uh, uh, Johan, Andrew, uh, let me say once again, a most sincere thank you for sharing your valuable time with us today. It is, it is greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, with that, that brings us to the end of our syndicate showcase for October. We hope you found it interesting and informative. Um, be sure to mark your calendars for our next syndicate showcase on November 9th, when we will profile Atrium. Uh, joining us will be CEO Richard Harris and underwriter Wesley Butcher. Um, when our session ends today, you'll receive a brief set of survey questions in your browser. Uh, we ask that you please do take a moment to fill those out and, and feel free to be completely candid in your remarks. Uh, your feedback is the only true measure of what makes for compelling content, so we greatly appreciate your assistance. Uh, you can also drop us a note anytime at usevents at lloyds.com. So uh, until next time, let's keep staying connected, uh, take care, and have a great rest of your day.